Good morning. Today is Wednesday, the 11th of August. Our opening sentence for morning prayer is from the prophet Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises, declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Grant to your faithful people, Lord, mercy and pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship, and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Psalm 7 O Lord my God, in you have I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me, and deliver me, lest they devour me like a lion, and tear me in pieces, while there is none to help. If I have repaid evil to him who has dealt with me as a friend, or plundered him who has, who without cause is my enemy, then let my enemy pursue me and overtake me. Let him trample my life into the ground and lay my honor in dust. Stand up, O Lord, in your wrath, and lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Rise up for me in the judgment that you have commanded. Then shall the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Lift yourself up again, O Lord, O judge all the nations. Give sentence for me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the innocence that is in me. O let the wickedness of the ungodly come to an end, but establish the just. For the, right, for the righteous God tries the very hearts and minds. God is my shield and my defense. He preserves those who are true of heart. God is a righteous judge, strong and patient, and God is provoked every day. If a man will not repent, God will wet his sword. He will bend the bow and make it ready. He has prepared for him the instruments of death. He makes his arrows shafts of fire. Behold, the ungodly is in labor with mischief. He has conceived wickedness and brought forth lies. He has made a pit and dug it out, but will himself fall into the trap that he has made for others. For his malice shall come upon his own head, and his wickedness shall fall on his own scalp. I will give thanks unto the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will praise the name of the Lord Most High. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel, beginning with the thirtieth chapter, the first verse. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag, on the third day the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept, until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Amalek, Bring me the ephod. So Abathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? The Lord answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and shall surely rescue. So David set out, and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook of Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and four hundred men. Two hundred stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread, and he ate. And they gave him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs, and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Jethrites, and against that which belongs to Judah, and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, they spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except four hundred young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, Sons or daughters, spoil of anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds. And the people drove the livestock before him and, he, and said, This is David's spoil. Then David came to the two hundred men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook of Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, they will not, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. 
who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is he goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. Then David came to Ziklag. He spent part of the spoils of his he sent part of the spoils to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth of Negeb, in Jatir, in Eror, in Sithmoth, and Esthemoah, in Rachel, in the cities of the Jehilmelites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Hormah, in Borashan, in Eshtak, in Hebron, and all the places where David and his men had roamed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting, to you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise, holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you, the noble fellowship of prophets praise you, the white-robed army of martyrs praise you, throughout the world the holy church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all praise, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you took our flesh to set us free, you humbly chose the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come to be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people. Vault with the price of your own blood and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. A reading from St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, beginning with the 11th chapter, the first verse. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says to Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left, and they seek after my life. But what is God's reply to Elijah? I have kept for myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it is seeking. The elect obtained it. But the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare, and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened, so that they cannot see, and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their in full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. 
For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered by as if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be angry at ang do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They are broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note the kindness and severity of God, severe toward those who have fallen. But God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. And if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you they may now receive mercy. For God has consigned for God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 
Come, Holy Spirit, come and fill us with your presence. Amen. As I think on our first lesson today, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, notice the predicament that David is, is in after this town, Ziklag, had been sacked and even his own two wives taken away, along with everyone else, both great and small, as the scriptures say. And it says the people were so angry with David. He's the one in charge, and anyone who's ever been in charge of something, um, you have a sort of dual job description. When people give you credit, you actually shine that spotlight on others because we never do anything successfully on our own. Uh, on the other hand, when people are angry, you become the lightning rod. And that's exactly what happened with David. He took the heat. And the heat was, the people were saying, let's stone the man. His response is, I think, telling and something that we can learn from. His response was to take it to the Lord, to have faith in God, to seek God's advice, to seek godly wisdom, to follow and obey the Lord. It wasn't to panic. It wasn't to strike first. It wasn't to do anything but, if you will, pray to God and trust in the Lord. And he did. And he received a word of knowledge from the Lord. Go and seek this band who had done this thing. And you see mercy showed to the uh, Egyptian who was a slave and sought refuge from David by saying, please don't, I'll tell you, but don't kill me and don't return me to my master. Set me free. Allow me to stay free. And the inference is that that's what happened. And so the Egyptian disclosed the location of the band. David fought them and prevailed. What else do we see? We see, and we've been told elsewhere in the scriptures, that not everybody who followed David has good intentions. Not everybody in the church has good intentions. It's a, it's a mix, is it not? Both wheat and tares together at this time. And so these people with bad intentions, they kept, they had the booty, they had the victory, the spoils of war, and they wanted to keep it for themselves. After all, in their minds, they had won the battle. Now David knows he has the wisdom. When do we, well, we know where Solomon got it from, not from David, but from God. Well, where does David get his wisdom from? From God. What's the wisdom of David? No. Share and share alike. Those who fought the battle and those who stayed behind to protect the baggage, those who were faithful but for exhaustion, they weren't going to be punished. They were going to spare in the spoils of the victory also. Not only were they to have their wives and children returned, but that which they have lost. That's God's grace. And David is seeking that. And you see what else David does is he sends out the spoils that he has to all the people who had been treating, treated him fairly. Again, wisdom. You know, it, it's, it's always wise when people have helped you, uh, not only to say thank you, but if the opportunity arises, to repay them, to give them something of the spoils of their investment in you, if you will. And so David demonstrates faithfulness to God and to wisdom. Now, when we get to the second lesson today, we continue with Saul's discussion about his own people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, and the predicament that they are in in the present age. And twice, you see, he mentions jealousy. And I think that's important. Now, jealousy has many meanings. But here's the way I think Paul is using it, and here's the way that you and I, I think, uh, could learn from it. If we are practicing Christianity, as I hope we are, in such a way that our faith, our walk, our lives, our words, and our actions match up, that someone might inquire, why is it that you're so different than the world? That's the opportunity to share the difference is not because we're good people or better people than the world. It's not that I'm a superman or a superwoman. It's because I've received the grace of God. And with that grace of God comes a knowledge, an understanding of the world, and a behavior as a son and daughter of the king 
that says life is different now. Life has changed. I'm reborn in Christ. You are reborn in Christ. And it gives us an opportunity, if you will, to put that word jealousy in quotation marks and people see what you've got in Christ. And they see what I've got in Christ. And they say, I would like that. I would like a different attitude than the world. I would like a, an attitude of, well, agape love. I wish that I had. You know, we hear those those songs. If you notice the opening to the Olympics, you know, um, there there's that song of John Lennon. It, it's you know, it also has a. If, I wish there were no religion. Well, if religion is, religion doesn't save us. It's Jesus Christ that saves us. So, I'm not in terrible disagreement with John Lennon on that because so much is done, in the name of religion, and which religion are we talking about? That becomes divisive. But Jesus Christ, he is divisive, but only in the sense that either people accept him or reject him. But he offers salvation and grace to everyone. So the division is created by the people who say, I don't want Jesus. But what does Jesus do? Does he beat them up? Does he uh, overwhelm them? No, he, he lets them go. Think of the wise man who Jesus, you know, what do I need to do? And he says, okay, here's what's going in your life. You're consumed by your pleasures. You're consumed by your riches. Give everything up and follow me. And the man can't do it because either, there's that little saying, you know, either you possess the riches or they possess you. Um, and, and they possessed him. And Jesus was sad for him. He didn't go running after him. He didn't go beat him up. He didn't drag him back. He let him go. But you see, Jesus died for him too with the hope and prayer that he will come back. He would learn. And so here's the thing. You and I, uh, like all Christians, are called to provoke the world to, quote, jealousy, end quote, in the sense that they see that we have something. And they want it. Peace. Love tranquility, grace, mercy. And my friends, if you're a practicing Christian and you have anger, hate, divisiveness, I, I challenge you. I challenge you as I challenge me when I express those behaviors to examine ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit, take away fear, take away anger, take away bitterness, take away... All of us have hurts. All of us have concerns. All of us see things that we don't approve of. Do you think God is any different than that? But you know what God did? And what God does? He sends his son to die on the cross to demonstrate a better way and gives us the Holy Spirit that by God's grace we can follow that example. And so I just want to look at, you know, the response here is, a faithfulness, like David's faithfulness, to trust in the Lord, uh, to know that the battle belongs to him. And, and I, I just want to quote a, a, a couple of verses here. Uh, verse 32, for God has consigned all to disobedience. You see, that's the situation of the Jews and the Gentiles, the men, the women. That's the situation of all human beings. He's consigned all to disobedience. We're not saved by our works, but by his grace. And how does verse 32 end? Let me read the whole verse. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. And then Paul, we're starting with verse 33, goes into a wonderful doxology. You know, oh, the depth and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Here's how we're saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
For grace, you have been saved through faith. God's grace given to us, all humanity, and faith in Jesus, his Son, his eternal Son, our Savior and our Lord. Let's continue now with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Almighty God, give us the increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you have promised. Make us love what you command, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us by your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor run into any danger, and that, guided by your Spirit, we may do what is righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you, bring the nations into your fold, Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time I invite your prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings, as the Holy Spirit places in your mind and on your hearts. Let us pray.
please join with you now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their request. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. I invite your prayers this evening uh, for our Bible study. It will be from 6.30 till 7.30 this evening at uh, Holy, uh, uh, Holy Comforter downtown across from Toomey Hospital. And anyone in Sumter are certainly invited and welcome to join us uh, for Bible study. And if you um, would you please keep us in your prayers that again we would study the, the, the good news of God uh, in the Bible and that it would be transformative uh, to our lives. And of course, if you're unable to attend, please attend a Bible study somewhere uh, where the, the word of the Lord is proclaimed and authoritative and full of teachings of truth. And truth always includes uh, the, the warnings, perhaps, of the prophets, if you will, turn, repent, it's a necessary thing. God loves us enough to care and to warn us of the dangers. But with that warning always comes the opportunity for repentance. And grace and mercy, therefore, is also part of that. We should not have either or. A church that only preaches damnation has no grace. And a church that preaches only grace without a call to repentance and faithfulness to God is not teaching grace. We need both. God bless you, my friends, and with the aid of the Holy Spirit and with God's grace and mercy, I look forward to joining you again on Thursday for our daily morning prayer.